Hey everybody, how is it going? Had a good lunch? Some nice sandwiches, good coffee, good drinks. All set to go for another couple of hours of awesome Google Cloud technology. So today uh, in my session, I'm going to talk to you about building a custom chatbot with API.ai and Cloud Functions. So who has ever built a chatbot before? OK. Who is planning to build one in the next, let's say, 12 months? Ah, obviously, chatbots are a little bit the hype right now. So I'm very gl glad that we had this big room to, to go through it with, with us together. So my name is Michiel van Toch. I'm a customer engineer at Google, based in Google Amsterdam. Uh, and in this session, we will cover three things. The first one is the, the basic building blocks of, of building a chatbot. The second one is a demonstration of how these building blocks actually work. So this will be the exciting part for me. And hopefully, also together with you, we can have some working prototype by the end of the session. And then, last but not least, uh, Tim Daniels from ING will uh, share what they have built the last six months and also the lessons learned along the way. But first, maybe it's a good idea to take a step back. So the people who were in the key uh, keynote this morning have already heard our mission statement to organize the world's information and make it universal, accessible, and useful. And if you think about it, this is also what we're doing for Google Cloud. So we're organizing your business information and make the information you want to share universally accessible and useful for your stakeholders, your customers, your partners, and also your employees. Um, What's maybe interesting about that is that we've developed a lot of tools for organizing information. We have covered big data. We're looking into machine learning. But the part I want to focus on is making it universally accessible. This not only means making it accessible across the globe with low latency and high availability, but it is also mentioning how people actually interact with your information. And that's where we see a lot of change happening uh, the last uh, few years. So traditionally, people had to adjust to technology to cope with it. So people had to learn to work with a keyboard. People had to, work, uh, to learn to work with a mouse, uh, stuff like that. You can even go back to the typewriter, where, where people also had to learn to work with, with typing and not writing or speaking, the natural way of people to com communicate. Uh, obviously, uh, at the end of uh, 2000, uh, around 2008, there was this uh, smartphone with this giant touchscreen which enabled you to use gestures to uh, actually use your fingers, you know, these tools you use every day to interact with the world around you, to also get something back from technology. Now, the third wave we are seeing in this evolution is the AI first, so that we really can talk to the computer like we do. So the, the humans don't have to adjust to technology, but technology can adjust to humans. So we can just speak like we normally do, uh, we can just write like we're no, no, normal write sentence to get something back from technology. And this is obviously where the chatbots uh, fit in. Uh, through the advancement in machine learning and compute, we are now at a stage where we are very confident in what the technology can do. And that's also why you see a lot of activity around this topic. So let's make it a little bit more concrete and look at the basic architecture. This architecture is both for voice chatbots, so you speak to them, like the Amazon Alexa, Microsoft Cortana, or of course the Google Home, but can also be used for text bots. So if you have it integrated on your website or in your mobile application, you can use the same basic architecture. So the first one is the user interface. Then we have the conversational agent platform. And uh, to fill it up, we have the fulfillment side. So we will go over them one by one. And later on, I will also show you how they work. So the user interface. This is where your user interacts with your bot. This is where it will connect with your chatbot. Of course, in Google, we like to think that if people are looking for information, a natural way for them to go is Google. So we are investing a lot in our Google Assistant. It's available on our Google phones, on our Google Home devices, but also on smartwatches in your car, so that you can be directly in touch with Google. You can also connect your own chatbot to Google Assistant. So you could say something like, OK, Google, let me talk to, your, to my chatbot, and you will get routed uh, to the chatbot you've just built. Of course, we also know that uh, not all users are on Google all the time, and they're also on other platforms. So we also want to offer native integration with that. So think about Slack, Facebook Messenger, Cisco Spark, uh, Microsoft Cortana, or also Amazon Alexa. And, uh, Third but not least, we also want to uh, have a software development kit available. 
uh, so that you can also integrate in your mobile applications, your websites, so that you can have uh, complete flexibility on how your users want to get in touch with your chatbot. The second building block is the conversational agent platform, and his job is very simple, but also very complicated. He has to understand humans. So he has to understand something like, can I get a pizza with bacon and cheese? Make that a large one, and oh, add some olives, standard crust. This very human way, unstructured way that people communicate. So we as developers, of course, we want to have a nice structured JSON format where we can act upon and we can do some nice applications upon. But that's unfortunately not, not the way how most people uh, talk to us. And that's where we have to find this conversational agent platform. And this is exactly what API.ai does. API.ai was a company we acquired less than one year ago. Um, and it's one of the top used platforms of building chatbots. Uh, just a quick poll, how many people are familiar with API.ai? So it, I think that's a, a nice, uh, and it's around 30 to 40% of the room are already aware of it. And I think if I ask this question within one year, it would be even more especially if you pay a lot of attention in my session. Um, OK, so we have the, we've covered the two building blocks now to the fulfillment side. So once we figured out what the user actually wants, we also have to make it happen. And this happens in the fulfillment side. This is your backend. This is where you write your application like you're used to do today. But also there on Google Cloud Platform, we have some very interesting options to look onto. Um, so the first thing you can do is you can build up your own virtual machines. You can build up your own network. You can set up your own firewall. And you can really build your application from the ground up, uh, having complete control over your configuration and uh, um, um, your control. Uh, the next thing you can do is you can move a little bit more to the managed service, to the more agile uh, way of working. You can use containers where the dependencies are already included, and you can run it in a managed version like a Google Container Engine. So this is a, the containers as a service. But of course, you can also abstract it a little bit more further and only concentrate on the application code. Then you use platform as a service, and this could be App Engine we have. For example, Snap, uh, Snapchat, is using, uh, Snapchat, Snapchat is using App Engine to be uh, globally available for all the customers uh, across the world without having to provision virtual machines, provision networks, only concentrate on their core application. And the most abstract thing we have right now is actually a cloud function. So you don't focus on the application level, but you focus on the function level. And from there on, you can sell how, how far you want to go. So, the more you go to the right, the more no ops you have. The more you go, you, you go to, the, to your left, the more control and configuration options you have available. Uh, the app engine zone, the cloud function zone, is what we call the serverless zone. This doesn't mean that there are no servers available. They're just abstracted away for you, and you don't have to worry about them. You can just focus on the code. The scaling will come automatically. So if you have one request or one million requests, you don't care. It just works. And also, you only pay for what you use. So this makes it very easy to get started with it, to play with it. And if it's a success, you can just uh, go with it. The same story we, we had at the Philips U uh, in the keynote earlier today. So when we look at the, the cloud functions specifically, they are very uh, perfect positions for an event-oriented uh, event architecture. This could be background functions. So for example, if you upload a file onto Google Cloud Storage, you can trigger a function, and you can, for example, get some metadata. You can use one of these uh, nice machine learning APIs to get some uh, metadata about a video of a, or about a, a picture so that you can launch it, you can uh, attach it to the storage. This is also available for Google Cloud Pops Up and also with Firebase integrations. The other thing you can do is you can make an HTTP function, and then you can use it as a webhook. You can then start to easily integrate it and use it, use it as sort of a glue for other APIs, like, for example, the G Suite APIs, but also with API.ai. And this is where, of course, uh, the perfect fit is happening. So this is the basic architecture. Is everyone clear with the three building blocks? Awesome. Uh, so now I will go over them in a demonstration. I will try to build a, a Google Web Store from scratch. So bear with me. Uh, we will go into this together, and we will see what we end up with. The things I will use is the API.ai as a conversational agent platform. For the fulfillment side, we will use a cloud function. 
And then on the user interface, we will see how it interacts with Slack and how that works in hopefully under 10 minutes. So let's get going. Okay. Bear with me. So the thing you see right now is the API.ai interface. On the left side, you have your configuration options. And on the right side, you can directly test it out and uh, start interacting with the chatbot you're building. In API.ai, there are two very important concepts to be aware of. The first one is intents. The second ones are entities. Intents are actions your people, your users want to uh, execute. And, and, and entities are objects your users want to act upon. So in my example, I want to, to, my, uh, to, to make this uh, Google web shop. So I'm going to make a product entity. And I'm going to sell, hopefully, some Google Pixel phones. And you see, you also have the option to add synonyms, because people use the same word for different, for the, different words for the same object. So I will also add Pixel. I will also add the plural, Google Pixels, and Pixels as well. Uh, next thing we want to sell is maybe a Google Home. Google Homes, and people also call it sometimes it's just a home and a homes. We have a Chromecast, Chromecast, and last but not least, the Chromebook, Chromebooks. And we've now created our own entities. The next thing we want to do is make a first intent. And you see there are already two uh, intents default in place. So the first one is the welcome intent. This will be launched when the user starts to interact with your chatbot. And the second one is the fallback intent. If API.ai is not able to figure out the intent, it's a fallback, and it will guide the user to the right direction by maybe asking to repeat the sentence. So let's take a look at the welcome intent. And you can say something like, user says hi or hello. And then you can respond, and you say something like, hey, Welcome to this awesome event. What Google products do you want? We save it. And now we can normally directly test it. So we can say hi. You see the default welcome intent is launched, and the response is, hi, welcome to this awesome, uh, awesome event. What Google products do you want? So of course, we also want to make our own intents. And if we're running a web shot, we're actually hoping that people will buy some, something. So we can, we can make an intent called uh, buy product. And the user could say something like, um, hey, can I buy five Chromebooks? Or maybe something like, can I get three Chromecasts? Or maybe something like, can you give me nine Google Homes? And what you see is happening that API.ai is using machine learning and natural language processing to figure out which entities are in place. So it's figuring out, ah, this Google Home, this Chromebook, this Chromecast, this is actually the product entity we just created. Next to that, it's also figuring out the number. Um, so we can give a response as well, say, like, sure. And then we can use parameters to refer to what the user said. So we can say, like, number of uh, product devices uh, are on their way. We save it, and we can directly start to play with it. So we say, hey, OK, the welcome intent is launched. Let's, uh, let's try to buy something. Can I buy uh, four Google Pixels, please? 
And what you see, indeed, it's figuring out the buy intent we just created. It's figuring out the parameters, the number, and the product. And it's launching uh, the correct answer we, we were hoping for. So let's make it a little bit more interesting and maybe add a delivery date. We call it dates. And what you see is that API.ai has a lot of uh, entity types already in place. So you have dates, you have geographic locations, you have time zones, all of these things. And the one I'm interested in right now is a date entity. The next thing we can do is we can make these uh, uh, parameters required for the intent to be complete. So we can say a buy intent is only complete if you have the number of products, the actual product, and also the delivery date. So we, touch, uh, we make it required. And then we can also prompt the user. If he doesn't give enough information, we can prompt something like, uh, sure, when do you want the product devices to be delivered? We can add a response as well. They will be delivered on date. Of course, we save what we're doing. And uh, let's try it again. Can uh, Also, something interesting just for you to know. So I trained a model with Google Homes, Chromecast, Chromebooks. And in my example, I was using the Google Pixel. So it's obviously smart enough to figure out, OK, I'm expecting an entity there. You don't have to give him everything. This is the power of these kind of entities. I can also now just add another entity, and it will also take it into account in all its training that it's doing. Uh, so let's try it out. Can I buy three Chromecast? OK. So you see, uh, at first sight, because I'm just beginning to train this model, it was not ready, able to figure it out. So it was asking me, well, what is the product? And now it's asking me, when should it be delivered? And we can say something like, uh, next week, Monday. Um, and what you're seeing here, I think it's very cool, is that the system is able to figure out, OK, the intent is byproduct, the number and the product are there, and the date is an exact date that we as developers love. You know? And we as a user, we just want to say tomorrow or next week, Monday. We want to act in a human way. We don't want to adjust to technology. This is the point what I was bringing earlier. So pretty cool or not? Oh, OK. Um, Another thing we can do, so now I showed you the, the conversational agent platform, how that works. But we also want to have this fulfillment side, this back-end side. So if people something actually buy something, you also want your ERP system to kick in. You want to really start something going on in your back-end. So to uh, show you that, I'm going to make another intent. And the way of linking intents is with another important concept called context. So if people are buying something, there is a chance that they also want to do something else. So we can, after that uh, an end user has bought a product, he is in some sort of a flow. And we could call this, we could call this uh, the buying mode. What we can do then is we can uh, make another intent. Uh, we call it add another. And we can here insert an input context also buying mode. So the system now knows that if they like, want something, the user has bought something, there's a big chance that, that, that he also will launch the add another intent. And the user could say something like add another or another one, please. Oh, we save it. And this time, we're not going to put the response into API.ai, but we're going to use the web hook, the fulfillment side, the, the third building block of my presentation earlier on. So the fulfillment is uh, configured over here. It's one web hook. It's uh, my project name in Google Cloud Platform, and it's a cloud function called fulfillment. I will now show you uh, how this one looks like in uh, Google Cloud Platform. So basically, it's a very short function written in, in Node.js. Uh, it's getting a JSON body from, uh, from API.ai, and it's going to look for the action field. And if the action field is something like add another, 
it will get the quantity, it will add one, and it will respond something like, here you go, the new number of devices are ordered. You set the HTTP header and you set uh, the status to 200, you send uh, a response back, and API AI can take it from there. Um, so now, I want to make sure that the, also the, the, the action field, so this is actually the field where my uh, cloud function is looking at, so this has to be there. And then we can normally try it out again. Let's go to the whole flow. Like, hey, welcome. Can I uh, buy? Maybe we can try, can I order? Five Google Pixels. Sure, when do you want the Google Pixel devices to be delivered? Uh, today, of course. Sure, they will be delivered. And you see now, again, the intent, API.ai was figuring out the intent. It was figuring out the, the good parameters by having a conversation with me as the end user. Um, and it's also giving now this context of buying mode. So API.ai is now aware from, hey, maybe this add another thing is something that I can expect now. So now for the moment of truth, uh, my three, my, at least two of my building blocks coming together. So let's try to add another. And here you go, six devices are ordered. Pretty cool, no? Ah. <laughs> I mean, it's maybe, maybe a little bit stupid for uh, this demonstration, but if you think about it, in just, I think, less than 10 minutes, we were able to have a fully scalable uh, chatbot working. Of course, it's still, a, still only a proof of concept, but if you start thinking about these kind of applications and you can really build this inside your companies to interact with your end users, with your partners, uh, but also with uh, your employees, for example, you can really already make a huge uh, uh, steps forward. Uh, so a last thing I want to show you is my final building block. Uh, this was the user interface. So here we have all the native uh, uh, integrations available. We also have uh, links to the software development kit. Uh, Actions on Google, I, I believe that you will know that this will be working. So I want to show you today Slack. We make sure it's turned on. And then we go to my API.ai bot and Slack. And we basically say, hey. Oh. Let's uh, do the one thing in IT that always works. Turning it off and on again, of course. OK. I can also blame it on Slack, of course. No. No. Hello? <laughs> ah. <laughs> Welcome to this awesome event. What Google products do you want? Ah. No, we're talking. This one is still not completely well trained. We can look into this uh, Chromebook. Ah, okay. That's uh, so. Uh, hi. Ah, no, I know. I think I only said hello in the training, right? So when I was using this intent, I was making this welcome intent. Just for your information, I only trained it on saying hello and hi, and I was saying hi, right? OK. I was saying hi with a capital. So this is where you have to train. The, the, the model will automatically train. So what you will do, and, uh, and uh, also maybe ING will touch upon this. This is, of course, machine learning. So it learns every time. So you have to train it. So you can say, like, hi. Uh, this should launch the default welcome intent. So you approve that. And then the, the system is learning, and you're making your product better and better. So that's where it takes a little bit of time. And that's where it's a little bit tricky for me to figure it out in 10 minutes. But we will get there. 
Uh, I want to buy three Google Homes uh, today. Uh, add another. Who has actually have a Google Home at home? Okay. So the one thing, like once you have one, you want to have one at, in every room because you start to get used to saying something like turn my lights on and turn my lights off. So that's why another one is a good uh, intent you maybe want to have. And here you go, four devices are ordered. <laughs> so there you go. Um, I hope this was uh, interesting for you. Um, as you know, uh, <laughs> it's always tricky to do a demo live on stage. But what I've did, I have went over these building blocks. I started with the conversational agent platform, showing you how you can input human, unstructured human data and transform it into JSON and act upon with a cloud function. And we did the nat native integration in, in Slack. So that was only a, a very short uh, proof of concept. I hope you can start to play with it and show it to your bosses and show you, uh, them how cool it is. But if you want to do the real work, it's interesting to listen to Tim Daniels from ING, and they will share uh, their lessons learned. Hey. Thank you, Michiel, and uh, hello, everybody. My name is Tim, and indeed, I'm uh, working in a small but enthusiastic team at ING, and we are actively building a chatbot for banking. And what I especially liked about the talk of Michiel was that it brought back the initial excitement we felt when we started to use Appy.ai. Now we are a couple of months later and we still like it, but it has evolved. So it's, it's a kind of journey and I will take you along in the next 15 minutes along this journey. But first I would like to spend a few minutes on why this um, is of importance to ING, this type of technology. So as we are in ING's hometown, I suppose that most of you know that ING is a global and universal bank, and there has been a tremendous focus on customer experience the last few years, and also on, let's say, fostering internally a real engineering culture. And the reason being that uh, bankers need to be where their clients are, and more and more, our customers are on social platforms, are on all other uh, digital ecosystems. So it's a very, very natural thing for ING to explore uh, the possibilities of uh, chatbots. And uh, so here she is. She's called Marie, and she's what we call your digital assistant. And it's about six months ago that we fired up Happy.ai for the very first time. And now, six months, six months later, Marie is in production for a well-controlled group of customers and ING employees. And as she will get better and better, because you need users to train her, so we train her thanks to the input we get from the first users, we will gradually increase uh, the group of people that have access to Marie, hopefully until everyone, uh, every customer of ING uh, can use her. Secondly, what can she do? Uh, she can help customers with questions and requests about cards. Uh, don't be mistaken, it's not a, she's not a question and answer bot, but she's what we would like to call a do bot. She does things for customers, like ordering a replacement card, activating a card for usage abroad, uh, resetting a, a PIN code, which sometimes happens uh, after a night out, as our people in the contact center know uh, to tell me. Um, Initially, we have spent quite some time on deciding what the exact scope of Marie should be, and now every day we are happy we did so, because having a clear scope for your bot uh, saves you a lot of energy along the way, energy you will need to cover all the other aspects that uh, come with building a decent uh, chatbot. Maybe a last word on why cards. First of all, cards, it's about what you can do with this uh, tangible piece of plastic. So in the people's head, there is a kind of natural boundary. It's clear for people when you talk about bank cards what you're actually talking about. And secondly, ING is still getting a lot of calls on, uh, from people who want help with their cards, like uh, resetting the spin code and so on and so forth. Why we have uh, chosen for Facebook Messenger as user interface? Well, simply because it is popular. As you have seen uh, with Michiel, it's very easy to deploy on other uh, channels as well. 
Now, before I uh, do the demo, which I hope will work, hmm? um, and uh, then we will, after the demo, we will also peek. I will open up Abby.ai so that we can peek into the brain of Marie together. Uh, and then you see, let's say, a more extended bot uh, than the one of Michiel. But before I do so, I would like to introduce briefly the overall architecture of Marie to you. And um, what you see is that for uh, the, the user interface, that was simple. That is just one component, it's Facebook Messenger. But the conversational agent platform, that we have split over two components. On the one hand, API, where we do all natural language processing, and that is important for us because we want business people to change what Marie is saying, and therefore we want to have all natural language generation, all the responses of Marie also in one place. And there is a second component, which is straight in the middle, and therefore we called it the middleman. And in that component, we have put some very specific logic for us. For example, we are at the bank. If a customer orders a replacement card, we need to make sure that we authenticate the customer. And because the middleman is in between Facebook Messenger, AppI, it knows at which point in the conversation to start the authentication flow. Authentication, which we do via a one-time password, which we send out via Twilio. Then on the mobile phone, the customer types it in, gives it to Marie, and uh, the person is authenticated. As you can see, we are fully in the cloud. So everything below this thick orange line are all the back-end systems of ING at 30 years of IT history piled up in the cellar. And uh, above is all cloud. Now, we did it in the cloud, and that is one of the reasons that allowed us to do it in uh, six months. Now, don't be mistaken, at the bank, security, confidentiality, GDPR, it's all important. So we worked very hard with our security officers, our information and operational risk managers, our fraud experts, to make it as secure as it needs to be. So we are uh, glad that we did that uh, with them and it worked out fine. There are three other components on uh, the screen, which is uh, the sentiment analysis API of Google, because we're keeping track of the sentiment of a conversation. Because if the conversation gets too bad, we want people in the contact center to step in. Therefore, we have the sentiment and intervention uh, dashboard. And then last but not least, um, Marie is talking English today. And we are looking into ways to make her quickly, let's say, uh, a polyglot. Uh, because in Belgium, you need at least three languages. Uh, for even, uh, so we are doing some experiments over there. Okay, now I hope, because this is a corporate laptop, and there is a demo with real backend uh, interaction, I hope it is going to work out fine. So can I have the laptop on the screen? Ah, okay, so you see here she is. The advantage of a bot is that she is not nervous, like I am. But luckily, uh, she still remembers me. Hi, Tim, she says, which is important for the personalization. And uh, for the moment, only English. OK. Now, I will tell her immediately, I want to use my card abroad, uh, which was one of the use cases I uh, told you about. And the funny thing is that within a minute, I will need this one-time password. And I had put my phone away because I did not want to be distracted. But I have to be distracted. Uh, OK, at first, we wanted to use only text. But quickly, we learned that once your customer is in a dialogue, please keep him there. And then visual elements, like you see here, it's called quick replies. It helps a lot. Now, a debit card is a more interesting case, because there it depends on the destination if the card needs to be activated as well. As you see as, you see as well, Marie, her responses are not, let's say, uh, flat. Uh, there's a bit of joy. There's a slight fun element, which is the personality of a bot, something you need to think about. Now, I'm traveling to Peru. And she will ask me 
if uh, she needs to activate my card, and I will tell her, yes, that she needs to do so. And she has sent me now uh, a PIN code, 268. Yes, yeah, th those are small things we, we still need to fix. Sometimes, um, uh, like, let's say that the conversations are not all yet up to standard. Aha. And now comes an important element, and which is nice in, an, in for example, Facebook Messenger. This is a, a carousel. Instead of asking the customer which card or what are the last digits and, on, and so on, we uh, show the cards a person has and uh, then it becomes much easier to do, to choose one. Now, I'm a bit, uh, I had to enlarge the screen a bit, so I'm missing here, because there should be extra cards available. Ah, voilà, they, voilà, there they are. Uh, and so what we do, as you can see, most of the information on the card has been masked. Uh, this is for security reasons. Also in the text below, you will see that we have applied masking because we do not want Facebook to know the numbers of the cards of our customers. Okay, they know that they will have cards, but that's not uh, much information. So I'm simply going to tell Marie uh, this one, and then, like Michiel already said, yeah, this is quite wonderful, of course. Dashes, slashes, you don't need to worry about it. Natural language will just make sure that you get where you need to be. Voila. And now Marie will send... Uh, she's now informing the people at the back end that they need to do something. She has sent a confirmation mail, and that's about it. Okay. Now, let's have a look into her brain. And uh, at this point in time, we have about 150 intents. So be prepared when you're going to build a real bot. Be prepared to have a lot of intents. Uh, we have about 10 full-fledged use cases. I think half of the intents are for that. And then there's a lot of stuff like small talk, what are you wearing, what, where are you living, how old are you, things people ask. and yeah, you better have an answer to that, otherwise they think Marie is boring, which she is not. Huh? Now, um, to keep structure, the dialogues we have are all multi-intent, and I will go quickly to the use a broad one with it. So you see that we are applying a naming convention, the name of the use case is coming back, and we are keeping track of where we are in the conversation. And to, to make that work, you really need to get your context right. So intents and entities are very important, but you will get nowhere in a more advanced bot without context. So we are setting two contexts, one for the overall use case, and the second one to make sure that the answer to the question Marie is asking at that point in time, that that answer is captured correctly. Yeah, so she is asking for the card type, so the outgoing context is then Oh, uh, it's about card types, and then we have the intent. Um, if it's a credit card, then you see this context coming back as an input context. Context is very important. I'm keeping also an eye on the time. Um, so multi-intent dialogues glued together by context, which means that the, con the dialogue logic is fully driven within api.ai. Yeah? So no coding there, it's all configuration, which we like. Now, I will, um, because time is limited, and I will not touch upon cloud functions. This is a very rich topic, and uh, we are around to, to talk about it, but it's better not to talk about it than to talk too shortly about it. Now, uh, I will demonstrate the last part, which is our conversation dashboard. Um, therefore, I will get quite impolite. So I will say, this bot is terrible. Oh. Which I sometimes, but seldomly, think. And normally, she is a bit sad. Ah, 
something went. Oh, whoa, oh, oh. whoa. Something, voila. Okay, so now someone in our uh, contact center has been notified that uh, a conversation is derailing. And for us, it is very important that people, even if the conversation, the automatic conversation does not work out, that they leave Marie with a good feeling. So we can step into the conversation, which is the second major role, apart from our authentication, of this middleman. And so I'm now, uh, you see here, the complete uh, trace of the conversation, like Facebook Messenger, right? this stays available for a long time, and I can turn off uh, Marie here, and I can hi Tim from the uh, contact center here. Voila, hoppa, and normally, voila. So uh, human takeover. This is uh, very very important. So if I... <laughs> thank you, thank you. So if you ask me, at the last six months you have, uh, you had a lot of fun developing this bot, what are your main takeaways? And I would say, one, make sure that you have a clear scope and defend that uh, against the many stakeholders you will get along your path. Two, make sure you master the concept of contexts. It's non-trivial, but it's very powerful, and it will allow you to make multi-intent dialogues. Then, as a, a third element, think about the personality of your bot, make it explicit. We worked with marketing for that and uh, agree upon it. And then the fourth element is, make sure that your bot talks as quickly as possible to other people than those who are building the bot. Because each time we did it, we were amazed by the creativity of people to say or to ask for simple things in a thousand different ways. Huh? So <laughs> you hand over the bot, then you see people going wild, and then you think, oh, I never thought of that utterance, and, and so on and so forth. So you need about 30 to 50 utterances for the entry intents, huh? which is the number we are striving for. Uh, that was number four. And number five is uh, never leave your bot alone. And with this uh, concluding words, I would like to uh, hand the word over again to Michiel for the wrap-up. So thank you very much, Tim. Very cool and interesting to see what you are building here. Uh, just to wrap it up, um, we have discussed some building blocks first. We were talking about this user interface, and there we said the uh, importance of being cross-platform availability. So you have these uh, native integrations as well as these SDKs to integrate with. API.ai, very powerful. And on the fulfillment side, you have a lot of options on the cloud platform as well. Um, interesting to note as well is that API.ai is for free right now. Uh, the native integrations as well, and for, for example, the cloud functions, the first one million calls or something are for free. So it's really easy to get going. You don't need budget approvals or something like that. Uh, and then when it works out, like in the case of Tim, you can own, uh, easily scale with demand. Uh, one last thing I want to give you before we wrap this up is that we've covered a lot of technical talks here. A demonstration and technical insights, but when you're dealing with humans, like the, the marketing, the how you deal with people becomes very important as well. Uh, while developing our Google Assistant, we have learned lessons along the way, and we are also sharing this with the community. So also uh, uh, put some considerable amount of effort in this interaction with humans. Uh, so. Basically, that's it. I hope it was a very interesting session. We did the basic run through and then the expert experience of someone running it into production. So I want to thank Tim again. I want to thank you for your attention and your uh, energy. And I hope you have a very nice rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.